renegade thinkers. If you told me four months ago that I'd actually be excited about doing a show on virtual events, I would, say, I would have said, you are out of your virtual mind. Now, let me explain. Part one of this is I love real events, and it doesn't matter if I attend as a speaker, a podcaster, a writer, a networker. I love the opportunity to learn stuff. I love the networking opportunity. I've also been to some great events where they have amazing uh, talent, great presenters, incredible tchotchkes, and don't forget about the hotel shampoo. I love hotel shampoo. It's just a weird thing. So the notion that a, f a virtual event could in any way replace a physical event to me is an anathema. And frankly, I saw a couple of the rush to market virtual events by some big companies that I respect, like IBM and Adobe, and I didn't think that they did anything to change my mind about virtual events. But live and learn. I recently had the pleasure of attending part of Skillsoft's Perspective 2020 Virtual Summit and was kind of blown away. It just seemed to a step above the other ones that I'd seen. The registration experience was easy and it made it easy to add sessions to my calendar. The production quality was, was consistently good and it wasn't all just side-by-side -side Zoom uh, interviews. They figured out how to address a global audience by essentially sort of going on a 24-hour clock. And the two speakers that I saw were terrific. So in this episode, we're gonna learn the details behind this event and what it takes to raise the bar with virtual events. To help do that, our guest today is Michelle Beebe, the CMO of Skillsoft. And because this is a topic of great interest to CMOs, we have a live audience of CMOs who will join me with questions and right now with applause to welcome Michelle Beebe to the show. All right, all right, how about that, Michelle? A real welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It is a, an absolute pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm excited to talk about Perspectives 2020. And, and you know, Drew, this is, um, it, it's great to see other CMOs on the line as well. And, and I look forward to answering any questions they may have as well. So we were talking in, in the warm up that uh, mm. that must, it, it was, must have been just an exhausting experience. And I want to share, <laughs> I'm going to share my screen for a second because uh, this is where when I first joined the summit, I saw this picture and this uh, <laughs> picture, let's see, I don't know if, uh, let's share it. I saw this picture and it was like 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> and there you are with all, all dressed up and excited to go. And there's this crazy man in ostrich uh, suit. Talk a little bit about the, that whole, oh. that part of it. Yeah, so uh, Jez Rose, one of my absolute new favorite people, he is a broadcaster, he is an educator, he is a behavioralist and a beekeeper. And um, I interviewed, right? I interviewed Jez as part of our pre perspectives warm up, right? Getting people excited about it. And when I tell you that we probably giggled more than we talked, um, it would be true. And the funny thing was, is that I had seen uh, Jez on Facebook um, doing something, I think it was his birthday, and he had this headdress on. And so during our, our podcast together, I said, Jez, nothing would make me happier than if you were to put on the share like headdress. Well, what Jez did was he went to social media and he said, what do you think? Should I wear the headdress or not? And so it was either wear share or no fez jazz and i think you can tell who won <laughs> well yeah wear share you know and it was yeah gosh it was recently uh share's birthday even and, i know uh, you know so uh amazing and and I, I guess step number one but you were so jazz was helping it with mc duty mm, for the yes. the sort of i'm gonna call it the the, the european shift mm -hmm. but you chose to do that uh, for the for the U.S. shift, um, I'm just curious about that choice. I mean, you put a lot of extra pressure on yourself to be the MC as well. <laughs> you know, it, it's really funny. I did. I think that um, when when we were looking at this, and, and you know, if you kind of go through the process, no one knew the content or the format better than I did. I was really immersed in this, probably too immersed. One would say. And so when it came down to who should host this segment, I think everybody on the team raised my hand for me. Um, 
Now, I've also had presentation training. I, you know, long, long, long time ago, I was a theater major. So I'm sure some of that might have played into uh, the reason that I was selected. But yes, my hand was raised very highly for me. So it, first of all, it must have been an incredibly long day um, since you started very early and it just kept mm. going. What were you most nervous about um, in, in right, you know, the day of the, the event? You know, it, that's a great question. So what's really interesting is if you think about it, I started at 7 p.m. Tuesday, May 12th, which was 9 a.m. Eastern, which was 9 a.m. Australian uh, Standard Time. So we kicked off this event in Brisbane with Michelle Okers. And so I actually went on the night before. Um, you know, for me, it wasn't about being in front of the camera. It wasn't about um, the, the safety that, that I will tell you that the measures that the team took to ensure our safety as well as their own were incredible. Um, what, what concerned me the most and um, was really were we going to be able to pull this off? Were people going to come? Were right. they going to stay? And then were they going to engage? Um, we, we had a feeling the content was good. Um, we were incredibly impressed by whether it was the business continuity panels that were so um, topical and timely, whether it was the head-to-head -head debates that were really contentious if you looked at them, um, whether it was just the keynote speakers who were there to inspire, we knew the content was probably going to be good. But if you build it, do they come, right? right. And we had all of these registrants. I think for me, it was, it was that moment. And in starting in Australia, I will tell you the minute that we went live and I had my first break, at which point somebody came to me and said, you would not believe the chatter in the um, main stage chat session it's going crazy and i thought uh it was the moment that i that i you know i kind of breathed a sigh of relief because we had actually we'd gotten people there and as you know it it sort of ramped up as we went along and we saw our largest audiences when we hit the united states uh the next day so one of the things that we talked about in the prep call before you had mm -hmm. actually done the event is that you actually reached out to some folks at Adobe to sort of figure out what it is that you needed to do to sort of do, to do better, yeah. if you will. What was, the, what was your takeaway from that? What did you learn that it enabled you to sort of push it a little bit forward? You know, I, I learned a lot from, and I, and, and I spoke with, with folks there, but also at, at other places that had done these events. There were so many other conferences that had come before us, fortunately. Um, and I learned, I, I will say that the best guidance I got um, was record every rehearsal, um, prepare for unexpected challenges, which, which we did. Um, we, you know, we had designs on this thing. You know, if you think about it, when we originally looked at doing this, we were going to have live studios. We were going to have people in studios in five different regions, and the panels were going to be there together. Because at the time, and if you think back to early mid March, we thought this thing was going to be over in the April time frame. And and as we got closer we recognized that wasn't going to be possible. And so we had to, you know, continually reevaluate our approach and um, change a lot of the decisions and setups that we had. So we had to build in redundancy and fail safes. And I would tell you that our, our tech, our platform and production squad probably did the most heavy lifting in the last month and a half as we got closer to the date, because we then had to take um, sessions that were going to be hosted live and in studio and turn them into absolutely remote participation only events, um, record them ahead of time in the event that they didn't go live to make right. sure that we had the content to put out there. Nice bit of redundancy there. Uh, it's smart. It's sort of, I love to prepare for the unexpected is, yeah. it, is great advice and, for anybody in any situation, but that's well, great for this. And then, you know, I will tell you that the other piece of advice I got was from the, the man himself, Jez Rose. I spent some time with him. He's obviously a broadcaster and presenter. And so he offered some guidance because he said, guess what? Something's going to happen and you're going to be sitting there on camera live and 
you're not going to know what to do. Something's going to go wrong. And I said, okay, what do I do? He said, you got to have a story, have a story, have something. You've got to figure out a break to go to. You've got to be able to go and talk because I've never done broadcast before. And don't you know that the second time that I interviewed Sean Acor, uh, who, who joined us and is just an absolute wonderful author of um, Big Potential, uh, he, his microphone wasn't working the second time I went to interview him. <laughs> and so I sat there and thought, what would Jez do? And so at that moment, I had my story ready. And then when the production team signaled they were ready to go to a yoga break, we kicked right to a yoga break. And I was so grateful for that guidance because I actually think I would have frozen, uh, froze otherwise. Right. Amazing. Okay. I have a one, or, <laughs> one or two more questions before we take a break. Um, sure. Your, your daughter, uh, Petra, joined you for the interview. And I'm going to share the screen for a second on that one because uh, I thought it was so cute. And I've been trying to get my daughter to join me on the podcast for a while. Um, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, and let's see, where is my share screen? Speaking of technical challenges, sorry about this. Let's see. Come on, where's my share screen? Uh, right Coo, here we you go. better have a story ready. I will. I'm ready. Thank you. So, yeah, there it is. No, let's go with this one. It's much better. Okay. So, um, what I particularly like about this, first of all, I want you all to see this framing. So you did have a studio. You were in Boston. Yes. There's your yes. daughter, Petra, on the left. You were on the right. And then there's the, the screen in the middle. And if you look at most virtual conferences right now, that's not the way they are. They're just side-by-side right. side Zoom. So you had some production things going on. But anyway, the point of this was picture is, how fun was this to do with your daughter? You know, um, there are not many moments that you recall in your professional career that are that are truly highlights both professionally and personally um and and this was absolutely one she um rose to an occasion that i, I can't even imagine i mean you had fourteen thousand people she's never been in front of the camera before um and and did an amazing job the questions she asked were hard-hitting and if you think about the number of people who've interviewed tara westover you've got ellen you've got oprah you've got bill gates and then petra bidek um <laughs> so but what i will tell you is the reason that we selected this was was there was a real valid reason for bringing Bringing Petra in, you know, Tara Westover um, didn't actually go to a real classroom until she was 17 years old when she entered college, right? And she found a way to get herself into BYU and then onto Harvard and Oxford. Um, and she had, she really had to figure out a learning path of her own. Um, and I think that there's this interesting parallel that's happening right now with our own students who are having to figure out how to learn in an environment that is vastly different. If you think about the institutions that have been afforded them, they've been told when to go to class and what to learn and where, you know, what they have to do almost minute by minute. And now they've been thrust into a new environment where, you know, yes, they may have some Zoom calls or Google Meets, but for the most part, they're having to really educate themselves with the support of their teachers and please make no bones the teachers are incredibly important but i found the parallel there so fascinating and i think it gave um, us a great opportunity to ask questions of tara that are relevant to the you know students petra's age and and even younger yeah, it was, a, it was a great interview. I was jealous the entire time thinking, oh, how <laughs> fun was that? Not just Jeff, because you had your daughter there, but also because Tara Westover, if you haven't read the book, Educated, mm. uh, it's one of, the great, one of the great and just shocking memoirs that you will ever read. I mean, it's uh, yeah. uh, phenomenal. I listened to her podcast interviews, which are just, uh, amazing. So um, that was Paul Gatz uh, Gatzigan, who's jumping in uh, in the moment. And, and uh, as you know, as we mentioned at the very beginning of this show, we have a live audience of CMOs who are so eager to ask questions. <laughs> they can't wait to get at this. But they're just going to have to wait for just a little bit more as we go through um, a rapid fire, as we sort of the, the, the things that, you know, details of this event. So how sure. long was the planning cycle from the day you decided to go virtual to execution? You know, it's really interesting because I just looked back on this and we realized early in March that we had to do something different. And I had to go back and look at the dates, right? Because all of this unfolded so quickly. And when I say early March, um, we held an update meeting on March 2nd. And over the course of that two hour update meeting, you could almost see 
um, you could almost see our faces shift as we realized that an in-person event was not going to work. People were already making decisions about travel. They were already questioning whether or not we were going to hold the event. We weren't clear on shutdowns, which happened, oh, by the way, just, you know, I think a week and a half later. And so between March 9th and 10th, we spent 28 hours over the course of two days in a design thinking workshop reimagining perspectives because it just couldn't be a simple broadcast version. So, and exactly two months and a few days later, you yes. produced this event. Okay. Yes. So was that enough time? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to amend that statement. Was it enough time? Um, Probably not. Um, was it the perfect amount of time? Yes, because if we had had any more time, we would have overthought the plan. We would have considered it far too ambitious and likely gone in a different direction. So time served as a great forcing mechanism. We were bold and we made quick decisions without the ability or, or without that sort of mindset of, oh my God, what have we gone and done? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, what platform did you use for this? We used a platform called Intrado, uh, and it's, uh, I think it's from a company called West. And, you know, like any technology, you know, we, we, we plan for challenges. But I will say that because it was so robust in terms of its virtual, if you will, trade show type capabilities, the fact that you could have main stage and then you could have breakouts and you could have chat rooms, that's really, we wanted to build that engagement layer in and we wanted to have multiple tracks as if you were able to attend a live event in person. And uh, were there any glitches in the technology or anything that you wanted it to do that it couldn't do? You know, um, I, I don't think that there were necessarily glitches into the technology. As I said before, the, the biggest challenges that we had were really in the original design and then where we ended up, right? And so what that did was it forced a lot more onto the tech team, almost too much, because now we had to go and record extra sessions when we thought we were just going to be doing live studio broadcasts. And so the redundancy and the fail saves put a big strain on all technical teams. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, that tech platform and production squad, which, you know, by the way, was just amazing, did so much heavy lifting in terms of getting that content uploaded because otherwise I, I don't think that we would have been successful. And so how many people did you have actually working on this uh, event uh, in total? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so we had seven agile squads. Um, and in those squads, we had a team of probably what I call uh, 35 to 50 core, if, if, I, if I actually did the numbers. But when I look at the perspectives team, it was 138 individuals. And I know because I went and thanked every single one of them. Good for you. 138 people. 138. Okay, that gives us a sense of scale. Let's talk about how many people registered for the event. Okay, so you can imagine we started off with incredibly high expectations for an event that would have drawn a, a thousand people had it been mm -hmm. in person. Our original target, and let me tell you, people looked at me like I was nuts. Uh, I mean, completely crazy. Our original target was 20,000. I'm excited to share with you that we more than doubled that. We had 41,000 registrants. Wow. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, every, every time we hit a number, um, we, we had to do something a little bit fun. And I can tell you that my head of marketing operations in the pink unicorn costume was probably my favorite. <laughs> so, all right, we have 41,000 registrants. And yes. then what um, percentage or can you, can you share yeah. how no, many I'll attended? Share Great. Yeah. So we had roughly 34%. So we saw about 14,000 attendees during that 24 hour period with the bulk joining us during the, the US segment. As you can imagine, um, it peaked very, very high during the Terra Westover section. But I will tell you that there were some other elements that really drew people in um, Special Olympics, and particularly when you looked at Kira Byland um, and Ben Hack, the um, response to their participation was so overwhelmingly positive. And Special Olympics having them there and having Mary Davis CEO uh, was it was unbelievable um, you would have for your regular event would it have been free your normal conference no. right oh, no. you charge no, 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 right no. yeah we charge. You would have charged. absolutely and so but you made this event free as mo most marketers and like the only one that I know that's charging was serious decisions mm. um, but uh, you made it free was there any um, debate about that you know, there was a lot of debate about that. And ultimately, we felt like 
it was important to make it free because number one, it was an opportunity for us to live our new brand. And if you if you've seen Skillsoft over the past six to eight months, we have we've really undergone a, a rebrand. And our vision is to democratize learning. And what better way to do that than to, than to open up an event that focused on the entire person um, professionally and personally? Um, we I I firmly believe, as does our company, that we have to make learning radically accessible to all, wherever you are, whatever you need. Um, but I will also say that the second piece about this is it felt like it was the right thing to do at this time, giving people the opportunity to come in and learn something. And the fact that we had 17, let me check the number really quick, 17 thousand pieces of content on our platform consumed at the same time and 619 digital badges earned during perspectives tells me that people were craving this kind of content. So in that when you say uh, 619 digital badges that's not the point system that that you no, were to, oh, no, but no, let's, no but let's talk about that because the the points that one of the challenges with a virtual summit is that we we yeah. tune in and then we look at email yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so you built in there was this point system that obviously mm -hmm. i believe came with a platform that you used to encourage attendees to do more than just say sit in on one session is that and That's how right. did that work you know i think it worked i think it worked pretty well um we we I, I'm surprised we didn't have as many people playing as I would have expected. So if you imagine that we had fourteen thousand attendees, we had only about eight hundred um, who played. And yes, you could win prizes, but the challenges were designed around engagement in specific areas of content. So you had to kind of be in those areas. So we had you know eight hundred people who said, right. "I'm going to go in. I'm going to get that code that's required for me to then go." you know, access and, and, and acknowledge or unlock that challenge. Um, and so that was great. Uh, the trivia side now, because we also had a, a trivia game going at the same time, which was more general questions about learning and career development and skill soft. We had about 2,500 people play that, which oh, was really incredible, right? Um, it appealed, we think it really appealed to people's competitive nature to get at the top right. of that leaderboard. And it was a fun break during some of these sessions because you know there was a lot of content here and we felt like we called them sprinkles and i don't don't ask me where that came from but for whatever reason we called them sprinkles and we tried to probably because we tried to sprinkle things throughout that um, would give people a break from the very heady content that we had in, in in the event and so i think you know that and the yoga breaks as well as some of the, just the fun teaser commercials were a way for us to give people a little bit of a time away and did people take advantage of those things because i did i was there at the end and saw the band playing and uh and whose name i will forget oh. but you'll remind me uh and and they were great but i you know i i didn't you know, attend the uh, yoga session. I'm just curious, did people take a, advantage of the sprinkles? Yes, they loved the sprinkles and we got <laughs> so much feedback. So first of all, the, 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 um, the group you mentioned, Black Violin, were unbelievable. I mean, the genre mixing between classical violin and hip hop, these gentlemen from Brooklyn, I, I can't even... Um, they were so amazing. And the, the way that we really gauged the level of in, engagement was in looking at the chat, right? We have the studio feed that's coming in and just the overwhelming positive feedback that we got. And I, I couldn't believe how many people were were engaging in the chat we actually had to add overnight just so you know when we saw what was happening in australia we actually had to add additional moderators so overnight we uh went and called a bunch of people um from the company and said hey would you like to moderate some chat tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> which which is a great yeah sort of last minute thing but it also it's a wonderful problem to have uh, and I think a lot of folks yeah. doing virtual summits yeah. would be thrilled to have that. So I'm as we sort of you think about it, and I know we're as as marketers, we rarely sort of pause and pat ourselves on the back and say great job. Mm -hmm. but what we have a tendency to do is what would we do differently next time? I mm -hmm. mean, it barely you've barely closed the curtain and you're already thinking about it. I'm sure you've done that. And yeah. and you probably have a short list of things that you would probably do differently. Yes, and the list grows as I go back and look at it because it's easy to become hypercritical of yourself once you've gone um, 
once you've gone back, I, th I think first and foremost, I want to acknowledge the 138 people <laughs> who put forth so much effort over the course of eight weeks to bring this to bear. Um, this event, by all means, was a success because of them, first and foremost. Right. Um, but yes, we we we've done our retrospective on the entire thing. We held we held weekly retros, but we went back and did a, a massive retro. Um, and I think that, you know, when we when we look back at it, there's some things that we would do differently. I think the sessions, some of them were too long, especially in a digital environment. I think uh, people are looking for smaller bite sized content, so we'll package it. Uh, that way. The other um, piece of guidance that I got that I thought was just wonderful was this notion of chapterizing the content so that you can move from one to the other. Um, they just build on each other, kind of like an a la Netflix. So coming up next, right, you just continue to go. And I think that will make it far more consumable. And then to be candid, I think we were so focused on that day um, that while we had really strong post perspectives plans in place, we really didn't think enough about what was going to happen beyond. And what we realized as we got a lot closer to the event is that this can serve as our primary demand gen engine for at least the next quarter or more to come. And we're now pivoting to determine how we augment this content with encore replay sessions, replete with, with what we're calling pop-up video inserts, which I think will right. be a lot of fun. Um, you know, chapter two, uh, where we go back and, re and revisit, meet with some of these speakers and do a retrospective in a month or two to say what has changed, particularly when you look at our business continuity panels or some of the keynote speakers, um, like Neelam Dwam, who is the head of um, IBM's Indie Advisory Board. I think those kinds of things are, are what we're gearing up for. It would have been very difficult to take that on ahead of the event. Right. But now that we're after, it's like, okay, we got to move faster. Right. Yeah, you need uh, some more agile, some, yeah, some that's teams right. to, to do that. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to mention that I thought you um, actually made a lot of the con uh, the programs, the learning things free after the event mm -hmm. for attendees. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. a pretty big value that you offered to them. And, mm -hmm. I, and I just, and it seems to fit very much with your notion of democratizing learning. I mean, you really mm -hmm. put your money where your mouth is. Not only did you give this, this summit away, but you gave your, the, your you know, the family jewels. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you talked about, when you talked about metrics, we looked at a number of things. Um, and I want to touch on this because we had a global audience of buyers. We had a lot of learners, we had prospects, we have customers. But one of the things, Drew, that's really interesting is about 79% of the people who came into Perspectives were net new to us, meaning that they weren't, you know, they weren't in our database. Um, and so, you know, we drove a lot of real-time engagement and, and we drove um, a lot of interest from people who hadn't yet attended. Um, but what we recognized is that we needed to keep these folks engaged, not just with the marketing content, but with the product that we have, because we gave them access during perspectives. And we said, to get the real value out of it, to go learn some new skills and to be able to gain it, we needed to extend that out. So we've offered 60 day, what we call free access. I don't even want to call it a trial, 60 day free access. There's no credit card. You don't put anything in. It's 60 days for free that you get into Precipio, which is our intelligent learning experience platform. And you have all access to all of the content there. Um, additionally, for university students, um, we elected to extend that to 90 days, knowing that, especially for those who are graduating right now, this is a really tough time. And we wanted to make sure that they could go in and gain some certifications, learn some new skills, and hopefully be able to find jobs when they do open up. And what a great way of being able to, again, put put the money where the mouth is and say, mm. we're, we're into democratizing and recognizing the moment, uh, which I, I, I is so profound. Well, I promised um, the, the CMOs in, in the audience that they would get a chance to ask their questions. So uh, if I'm going to switch modes here uh, for a second. And uh, so uh, let me know, uh, who, raise your hand uh, or just, uh, if, oh, okay. So let's start with Gabby Ziderveld. You're, you're on mute, Gabby, um, who is the CMO of Effectiva. Gabby, go for uh, it. Great. Thanks, Drew. And uh, thank you, Michelle. Super insightful and really impressive what you and your team have pulled off. Um, my question for you is the following. In terms of your goals and KPIs mm -hmm. for the event, how were they different than the goals you would typically set for your in-person event? 
You know, that's a really, that's a really great question. So, you know, typically when we look at an in-person event, the, you know, some of the value of having an in-person event is that you, you've brought people to a place, you know, they're going to be um, engaged somewhat. Yes, they might walk out, but, but for the most part, they're a captive audience. That's not the case when you're in a digital environment. And so we had to look at things very differently. Certainly registration was our first benchmark. Are we going to be able to surpass that? Um, attendance was really important to us because that's something else that, you know, you can register all day long, but actually coming and attending. But we wanted to look more closely at um, consumption, right? We are a content company in and of ourselves. So looking at content consumed is really important. How many sessions did people uh, engage in and to what degree and then how many minutes consumed and just so you know there were 1.4 million moments um, of content consumed over the course of 24 hours um, and then obviously we wanted to look at you know the the the, the audiences and we're doing an so much with the analytics right now, looking at who are existing customers, um, who are potential prospects at enterprise size. So just breaking all of that data down. But really the consumption metrics, Gabby, are something that we probably wouldn't have set for ourselves necessarily in, a, in an in-person environment. That's okay. Great, uh, great I question. I just want to ask one follow-on question based on what Michelle just said. Sure. Sure. So, Michelle, you mentioned engagement a few times. and. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, having an engaged audience, uh, highly important for any event. Um, you said you had looked at the chat, but were there any other engagement type metrics that you were able to derive from the online activities? Um, we had we had tremendous, um, the, the number that we're working on right now, and I don't want to give you an exact figure because we're still trying to make sure that it is accurate, is the number of minutes consumed per attendee. Right now, we actually believe that that number is exceptionally high. And I think even when we um, normalize it, because I think there's some normalization that has to go on, it's still going to be higher than, say, the average 8 to 12 or 15 minutes that we're seeing. I mean, the, the amount of content that somebody consumed, because I think we had this main stage experience that just kind of went on and was hosted, in the sense that you, you never you never really had an opportunity to drop out. Um, I, I think it kept people engaged. They were interested to see what was coming up next. So I want to normalize those figures, but the number of minutes consumed per attendee is overwhelmingly, it's huge. We were really impressed by that. Yeah, I, I have to tell you from a production standpoint, there were just all sorts of little things that would go on, like a countdown clock before the next speaker. Mm -hmm. There were things that just made it uh, harder, if you will, to walk away. <laughs> uh, and and I, it was sticky. It was for strange. Okay, so next question. Uh, Ian, I think you had a question. Yeah. So you, let, you said let, me you... let me introduce you. I'm sorry. Ian Howes, who is the CMO of Sage in tech. Go ahead, Ian. Thank you, Drew. So great, great presence, great uh, knowledge about what you did. Um, you mentioned that we need good content. So for me, yes. is that if you have great content for a live event, that may not be good content for a virtual event. And um, how do you kind of distinguish what good content means for a virtual event? Oh, I'm so and, glad and you asked that question. One Go ahead, related, no. Just kind of related, which we, we kind of discussed is, um, I, I, did you allow, allow competitors to come and look at the great content? Um, okay, so let me answer that piece first. We, we, um, you know, if you came in with a, if you came in with a competitive um, email, we, we, we asked you not to attend, but we know competitors attend, and, and that just was, you know, it, which is fine. Um, we, I didn't, I didn't have too much of an issue with that. Um, we did have a product innovation roadmap session that we. Uh, had only four customers, and so you had to have a special uh, access to that because we wanted to obviously be very mindful of our of our IP. Now that said, um, you know when we looked at the event, we recognized early early on that you can't just take something that you would do in person and plop it into uh, a virtual environment. And so we took a lot of during that twenty eight hour period of of design thinking, we we took a lot of inspiration from I will tell you some of the most unexpected places. And, and you probably won't believe me, but really best in class, what we call digital experiences. So the Super Bowl, which is a tune in moment. If you are even watching on television, it's live. Why do people attend live? Because they, they, you know, it's happening in the moment. You don't want to see it after. 
Um, but, but from a digital experience perspective, how Apple does their product launches. Peloton, really, really great at driving community and getting people engaged um, and participating with each other and competing. Um, the Bachelor, believe it or not, for their social, what they do in terms of social and getting people engaged in that moment. And so that's where a lot of the chat, um, the work that we did around chat came in. And then I'm going to date myself here, and hopefully some of you will at least acknowledge, um, but the Jerry Lewis telethon, this idea that you're constantly going for 24 hours, and, you know, it served as tremendous inspiration for those of us who are old enough to remember, um, but this mindfulness that, that you are going, you know, that you are in a shared experience for a long period of time. Now, from, your, from, a, from the perspective of the actual content itself, Ian, and not just the experience, um, we knew that we had to do some things differently rather than just get up, stand and present that people probably were going to tune out, especially with our customer presenters. We took a very different model and we looked at kind of that um, HBR style case study where we had a written case study for our customers and then um, a 10 to 12 minute TED style talk with the presenter and then a Q&A because just standing up there with PowerPoint, going through it for 45 minutes wasn't going to work in this environment. And we actually have found that the engagement with the customers uh, was really, real, really well received. And um, we're probably going to use that as a model going forward, even potentially, and we'll probably test this when we, when at some point we go back to an in-person event, because it was incredibly compelling. You had to be far more concise and you had to really get your points across in a short period of time. And, and they did an amazing, amazing job at that. Okay, we have time for two more questions and we have two more CMOs. So Holly Rolo of uh, RSA, would you like to ask a question? Yes, I would. Um, the, you talked about um, kind of making this change from doing the physical event to mm -hmm. the virtual event. Um, can you talk a little bit about the roles on your team you had to pivot? You know, there's new skills involved, right? So event logistics ah. is very different than live and video production. Yeah. And, you know, maybe be more specific in terms of the 138 people involved, you sure. know, of the, of the core event team, um, what were the skills that needed to be adjusted and how fast did that happen? Um, well, it happened very quickly, I will tell you. So, so just, just as some, just as framework, and, and Drew knows this, and it's probably a discussion for an entirely separate day, but we are an entirely agile shop, right? So our marketing is all agile. So we had seven squads. Um, main stage programming, our executive advisory board was a separate program, it was a separate squad. Um, we had marketing and communications, we had tech. Um, we had on-demand programming, which was our product sessions. Um, and so if you think about those squads and the, the people they comprise, we had to have everyone from our account teams who knew our customers to help us engage with them and, and bring them to the fore. Um, I actually was the product owner for the main stage squads. And so we had to have people who knew how to build these kinds of panel sessions. And so I engaged some of our SMEs internally, um, uh, the heads of our businesses actually. So we have a leadership and business um, unit. Uh, we have a tech and dev unit. We have a compliance unit. And so bringing them in to help um, craft some of this content and then we actually had to leverage our PMO quite extensively, um, particularly for the um, tech and platform pieces. And then because there was the Percipio angle, which is our, which is again, our intelligent learning experience platform, we needed to make sure that people could get in, that, that we could provision all of the licenses. I mean, you're talking about 42,000 thousand licenses. Um, and so what we what we did was we brought in, um, I want to say three or four people from our Percipio team. And I want to give a shout out to Heidi and Inga in particular, who ensured that that experience was absolutely seamless. And when you look at uh, the way that people came into Percipio during the during the event itself, um, it's really, really clear that they found value. Um, and then we did have our events team, you know, and I think that, you know, I, I spoke with our, our head of events yesterday who came to me um, openly and honestly and said, look, this is the first time I'm doing this. And I said, guess what? This is the first time I'm doing this too. We'll do it together. And she said to me yesterday that, you know, she had gained so many new skills and I think it goes to the production team. I don't also want to diminish the role of partners though. So we had our 
primary agency that played a critical role in helping us with a lot of the content and believe it or not, the scripting. There's a lot of scripting involved in this. Um, and then we actually had our um, event agency, you know, the, the, the team that actually produced this um, local to Boston called Kramer, which is actually where we hosted the global studio. And again, we did it incredibly safely, very, very, very small staff, and we were all socially distanced. Um, and then we had um, some other folks who, who came in to help us out, whether it was in, in searching for things like our yoga break. But I, I think that the, probably the biggest um, partner impact came from a company called People Matters. And um, they are a media and, uh, and HR tech company um, in the APAC region. And I'm so grateful to Esther Martinez and People Matters because we had to create content that was appropriate for each of the regions in which we served. And there is no way that we could have addressed both APAC and India unless we had had People Matters. They brought not only valuable content to bear, so when you looked at our head-to-head -head debate, um, that debate had to be focused in India on, on topics at hand, like who owns the skilling agenda? Is it a government or is it private sector? That was topical and germane to that region. Um, or having Neelam Dwam, as I mentioned, keynote on designing the future organization. So having um, the regional partners as well as the regional hosts, whether it was Michelle Okers or Jez Rose or Lucy Adams who came in and presented in EMEA, it was really important that we brought to bear content that was going to resonate with the audiences in each of those regions. Hopefully that okay. answered the question. I know it was a little long, Holly. <laughs> no, but the, that, that was a lot Thank you. and it was really meaty. So Mark Floizen from Covio, would you, would you like to ask a question? Sure. Drew, thanks. And Michelle, great information. I guess a follow on picking up on your point about the different squads. You mentioned mm -hmm. you had a technology squad. I'd be curious on any insight about uh, the sort of criteria they had for platform selection, for delivery of this stuff, how much was your own product, uh, what sort of third parties did you evaluate, any insight into the platform that made all this possible? It's a great question, you know, because I, I think that initially when we got together, people thought, well, we'll just use our own platform. Our platform is an intelligent learning platform and it does an amazing job doing what it is, but it is not a social engagement platform. It is not a trade show environment platform. And it's, it's, it's not designed to do what it is that we needed to do, which was um, have, uh, bring all of these people together in a main stage environment and not necessarily create the feeling of an in-person event, but give us options. And nothing, um, none of the sort of traditional webinar platforms did that. And so we had to look for something that was really robust. And Kramer, to their credit, brought uh, Intrado to bear. And it is a virtual trade show environment. And I believe um, that we're going to see far more of these kinds of companies pop up with the capabilities that are far more robust. We pushed this platform to its very edge and, and probably everybody on this experience to the very edge because, you know, we wanted to do more. We wanted specific chat rooms by track. We had tracks that we had set and we wanted you to be able to go in and do that. We needed to have a separate experience for our EAB. Um, as, as you saw from the, the screenshot that Drew showed, we had very specific branding. That branding needed to be not only available in the platform itself, but then in our own solution. And so, you know, it was, um, it was a really great experience. I think it was a growing and learning experience for us all. But what I will tell you is I think as, as this, you know, I, I don't see us going back to live events, any in-person events, um, anytime soon. I just, I, I just don't know when and how. And I think this pivot that we're all making is a good one and it's the right one. But now the technology needs to, needs to grow and extend. And I think that the one great thing that's going to come out of this is we are going to see these platforms become far more robust in their capabilities. So uh, this has been amazing. I have, first of all, th want to thank uh, the CMOs who were able to join us uh, for, for this session. Uh, and Michelle Beebe, thank you for, for your honesty and, and sharing that. Yeah, we could give uh, Michelle another round of applause. Oh, thank you. I'm watching all the virtual applause. It's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Um, and 
I, there's just so much uh, here that uh, I feel like I'm going to have to go back and listen to it and, and take more notes on it. So I really appreciate uh, all the insights uh, in it. Uh, any last word as you, as you look forward uh, ahead, any advice to, uh, that you'd like to impart on uh, the rest of the, the Renegade Thinkers audience? Well, I would be remiss as a marketer if I didn't tell you that all of this content is now available on demand <laughs> at skillsoft.com slash perspectives. Um, and I encourage you to go take a look at it. I will, I, will, I will tell you that I have been back several times to watch sessions that I could never see in person. So if you have the opportunity, again, skillsoft.com slash perspectives. But, you know, I, I would also say that um, any feedback, and I truly mean this, I'm LinkedIn, I'm Michelle BB. I appreciate any and all feedback because it only makes us better marketers when our peers are there to, to say, hey, have you thought about this? Or maybe if you had done this. And so go take a look and then, and then share it with me because I think that's, that's what our role is, right? Is to take that feedback in and then get better over time. Well, there you have it. Uh, we have the URL. I went there. I did it. It was great. <laughs> So, all right. Uh, again, thanks, Michelle. Thank you to uh, the CMOs in, in the audience and to the listeners. As always, and until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.